And this is the first of several lecture segments on closure, one of the most important concepts in JavaScript and related languages. Now, before we illustrate closure, let's look briefly at the latest version of our linked list constructor. This is linked list 4.js. It's derived from the prototypal inheritance example from earlier lectures, but as you'll see here, there are three changes. First, uh, we've removed the drop function uh, just to reduce clutter. We don't need it for this discussion. Second, the apply function has been renamed to for each to match the name of a similar function of array uh, at which we'll be looking. And then third, there is a map each function that's very similar to for each except that, uh, as you can see, it, it does call a function on each data value, passed in as a parameter there, action, but it uses the return value of the function to replace the data value. Thus, the function is a sort of map in the mathematical sense. It converts the linked list from one set of data values to another via calls of action. Now, an essential prerequisite to understanding the workings of closure is comprehending the runtime stack, RTS, and stack frame concepts from languages like Java and C. Closure is tied closely to the management of stack frames or their JavaScript equivalent. A review set of lectures from a standard C course is provided as a resource. Read it and understand it or read and understand equivalent material before proceeding. As a reality check, we'll have a series of in-lecture questions here. And please answer them. And if you can't answer them, then be sure to at least read the RTS transcripts, even if you don't have time to listen to the lecture recordings that go with them. These in-lecture questions reflect the level of comprehension that you have to have on the RTS in order to start understanding closure. So, perhaps after some review on your part, here's question one. If there are two local variables, call them local1 and local2, and they're in two different functions, say f1 and f2, and this is C or Java, might they occupy the same location in memory? Not at the same time, of course, but might they occupy the same location at two different times in memory? And if so, how might that happen? Coming back from a pause, if the two different functions are called in succession from the same caller, so we call f1 and then f2, so that each has stack frames occupying the same area of the runtime stack, then it might be that the memory areas for local 1 and local 2 would coincide. So question two, if they do occupy the same location, would they do so every time? Or might they sometimes do so and other times not? And if the latter, how? Again, coming back from a pause. Well, it all depends on where the stack frames for F1 and F2 are. If, for instance, F1 calls F2, or perhaps F1 is called after a different sequence of parent calls than an earlier call of F2, then their stack frames will be in different spots and so will their respective local variables for those calls. In question three, so what exactly happens to a local variable when its owning function returns in C or Java? Is the local variable erased? Could I retain a pointer to it, at least in a language like C that has pointers? Coming back again from a pause, the variable continues to exist, but it's in a part of the runtime stack that is above the top of stack, and is thus technically garbage. And the variable is vulnerable to being overwritten at any time by another function call. So retaining a pointer is definitely not reliable. It would be a bug. Okay, so let's look now at the code for total.js down here. Now, this sets up a linked list, three elements, with content uh, 114 and 42 in that order because of the way the push works or the add works. And it reports the sum. It does that by calling for each on the list and passing it a function whose action is to total up each value into the variable total and then report the sum. Let's uh, run it briefly here. So running total.js. Total is 156, so um, that's looking pretty good. But something uh, kind of interesting is going on here. Let's call the big function, starting on line 3, the outer function. And the one created on line 9 here, the inner function. Now, total is a variable of the outer function, not the inner function. 
the outer function doesn't even directly call the inner function. It calls for each, which in turn calls the inner function. So apparently the inner function is reaching back across two, cell, call, two call boundaries to modify the total local variable of the outer function, as we can indicate in an RTS diagram here, and, and be sure you understand this diagram. We have the get call of outer, um, which we were looking at. It calls for each. That calls the inner function, which is reaching back to the outer's um, uh, stack frame to uh, modify the total. Now, this doesn't seem impossible. The stack frame of the outer function call exists during the for each call, uh, and so does total. But as we'll see in later examples, it gets more complex. So consider now the adder.js file. We start by setting up sample linked list object uh, right uh, here, as before. But there is a faster way to do it than uh, all those add calls. We create an array of three numbers um, by constant array declaration and then call its for each function. It's fine to call functions on array constants like that, by the way. They're, they're legitimate array objects. Now, array.prototype.for each does the same thing for an array that our for each does for our linked list. It calls the past function once for each array element. And here's that closure concept again, because the inner function passed to for each is adding each array element to list, which is, of course, a local of the outer function. The result is a quick initialization of list to contain those three elements, though note that they'll be in the opposite order from the array because list.prototype.add does a push to the front of the list. Uh, it doesn't add to the end. Okay, now that list has some data, let's uh, try the map each method, transforming each data element in the list to a new value. We'll create a function adder that uh, adds an increment to its parameter uh, and uh, returns the sum. And, and passing this to map each, as we do, uh, should increase each data element. And so the for each call on line 13, which is just printing the changed linked list, confirms. Actually making it run here. There is adder.js. 110, 24, and 52. We increased each element from what it was, and remember they're in backward order, uh, by 10. So it worked um, as advertised here. But note how we created the adder function. We called make adder, passing the amount by which we wanted to increment, the 10. So make adder is an outer function that creates and returns an inner function, which we referred to by adder. And as before, the inner function may access the parameter, inker, of its outer function, make adder. Parameter is really a form of local variable that gets initialized. But inker was, note the past tense, a parameter of the now returned make adder function. It should cease to exist upon make adder's return. How can the adder function keep referring to it throughout the call of linked list dot um, map each. In a conventional language like C or Java, this would be impossible. But under JS closures, an inner function may continue using the local variables and parameters of the outer function in which it was created, even if the outer function has returned. This is a remarkable feature, and as we'll see in the next lecture uh, segments, it allows many interesting designs, all of which involve creating a function object that retains some or all of the locals and parameters that existed when it was created. And in the very next segment, we'll look at how this feature is actually implemented using the JS runtime stack, and the idea that a JS stack frame might actually exist for longer than the running time of the function call to which it belongs.